Dear audience, I am pleased to meet you in a Power of Law program. Ms. Ellen Goldberg, Director of Integrity Education Network of TD International Organization, accepted our invitation to participate in the program. Uh, well, hi, Ellen. Thank you for accepting our invitation and coming to our studio. It's my pleasure. The, can you describe uh, activity and uh, which kind of projects the TD uh, carried out and what is the purpose of your visit to Armenia? Sure. Uh, TIRI has five different programs that we operate around the world in different regions. We work in China and Indonesia and in Eastern Europe and Central Asia countries, as well as in the Arab world and in Africa. And the programs are different in their focus, but they're all moving towards the same goal of promoting integrity and professionalism in people's personal and professional lives. So um, the programs that we have are sort of in groups. We have two different programs that function in the area of education. One is the program that I'm director of, and that's the Integrity Education Network. And through this program, we work with universities and national training institutes to work with the academics to learn how to teach integrity education for their students and in the training institutions to teach trainers so that they can work with public officials or other professionals who are on the job and their practitioners. And through these two programs, we work, um, focus very much essentially on how to teach integrity education so that it connects between the theories behind it and the practice out in the field so that the teaching and the work that the students have to do is very, very practical so that they're more ready when they leave university and go into the workforce to actually face corruption issues and challenges to their own integrity. Then there are two additional programs, one that is has a focus on pro-poor integrity, which works with citizen groups and non-governmental organizations to train citizens to monitor or to um, follow what their local governments or their national governments are doing with budgets and with public service delivery. So citizens will work together with the local government and they will provide feedback on the level of service delivery and they will help the local government to solve some of the service delivery problems. And from the perspective of local government, they are, shall I say, encouraged to work with the citizens and to see the benefit to them and to their work by having people who are you know, out there in the field experiencing the services and to tell them where some of the problems and possibly some of the solutions could be made to improve services. The second program that works to promote um, citizen involvement is our network in reconstruction. And this operates in countries that are post-conflict, where they're really rebuilding societies and in many cases rebuilding the country's infrastructure. And here, citizen groups are trained to follow up on how the budgets, most of which come from international donor organizations, how the government uh, implements the budgets and to make sure that the, um, the donated funds are used for the projects that they are designated for. And the final program is a program called Democratic Governance. And this program focuses on integrity within electoral processes but through elections, how you run an open and accountable election, and also to strengthen judicial systems and the work that the judiciary does related to integrity and making sure that uh, the judicial system works with as much integrity and, and uh, professional ethics as possible. But what's the purpose of your visit to Armenia? The purpose of the visit um, was to help conduct a workshop that had both Armenian academics and Georgian academics. And we were teaching them 
to take the courses that they currently teach and to incorporate elements of integrity education into those courses or also to develop a completely new course. And um, what's interesting about it is that we have academics from many, many different professions that are very diverse. But really, every profession can work with integrity or could be corrupt. So although it sounds difficult to teach people who come from such different professional backgrounds about integrity, they really each are able to take the elements that are relevant for their discipline and their profession and incorporate it into their curricula and into their syllabi um, and have uh, what, we, what we hope are, are better courses and courses that help the students understand how to live and work professionally with integrity. So what is integrity and uh, what's the difference between integrity education and anti-corruption education? That's a good question <laughs> because it is, it is complicated. The two issues, of course, are very interconnected. And anti-corruption education is definitely um, critical to fighting corruption. The difference is in many anti-corruption initiatives and in the education, the focus is on identifying corruption, on analyzing it, on investigating and prosecuting corruption. And that is all important, and it is work that absolutely must be done. So it's a very important um, aspect of the work. The difference then with integrity education is that integrity education, first of all, includes anti-corruption, but it's a bit broader. And it's broader because when the ultimate desired impact is that there be more integrity and more, um, more positive work that's done with integrity, you have to add additional topics and train in additional topics. And these topics, the way Thierry sees them, include several different issues. The first issue is accountability. And accountability itself is a concept. It includes a lot of, a lot of traits, a lot of different characteristics, elements. a lot of elements. So first of all, definitely transparency, which means that any organization, whether it's a private corporation or whether it's a state department, a state institution, a department within the state government or the national government, um, they must make, act, make information that they have accessible to the public because we feel that it's the public's right to understand and to have information about what the government is doing. So accountability is, includes transparency and access to information. It also includes other topics such as understanding their social responsibility. So it's very easy to understand that state government has a responsibility to its citizens and therefore um, is accountable to the citizens in the same way that a local official is accountable to his or her supervisors and to the regional or the national government, the local official is also accountable to the people that they serve. So that's an important element as well. The second main component of integrity as we see it is competence. Competence means professionalism. It includes reliability and professional ethics. It um, is something I should say that um, when a citizen goes to a local state office and interacts with the official, for an official to really work with integrity, he or she must also be interested in what the problem is and responsive to the needs of the citizen. And to act as professionally and with high quality as they can. And so that's a second element that joins accountability in moving towards full integrity. The third element that is essential, and I already mentioned it in, in, indirectly, is the whole area of ethics. And ethics includes working in a way that is moral, working in a way that is honest, working in a way that is um, 
responsive and understanding and accepting of social justice issues, meaning that everyone in society should have equal rights and public resources should be uh, distributed in a way that is equitable and helps to actually be, meet the needs of the public. And um, I think one of the most important words also related to ethics is trustworthiness and the trust that um, a public official's work or a business official, but also very much so a public official's work, that uh, the public should be able to trust the public officials and believe, and believe in the work that they're doing, that they're doing a good job, that they're providing information, that they're working honestly, and that they genuinely believe in providing services to the people that the people deserve. And in your opinion, what kind of uh, mechanism uh, should be implemented uh, for, to ensure uh, integrity in public administration? There are a lot of different measures that need to be in place. And um, I'll list a few of them that are, that are important. Um, first of all, there are what are called codes of ethics or codes of conduct. Mm -hmm. And that's very important for every organization that has a mission and a vision to also set out what are the appropriate ways that, um, that the officials and the employees should be acting and, and working. And also regulated of conflict of interests. Conflict of interest is definitely an important part of that, um, of that whole uh, system because um, you don't want conflicts where um, it might seem or it might actually be the case that someone is working when they have some external interest connected to it or some personal interest. Sometimes it's okay to have a personal interest in something that you're doing as long as it is declared and it is acceptable within the organization as being a proper and um, non-interfering uh, kind of uh, interest. Uh, there are systems that need to be in place. For example, if you're using uh, information and communications technology for management information, for financial information, also for procurement, which is where a high percentage of public money goes, is to purchase services externally, whether it would be in, with, uh, um, with builders for major infrastructure projects or with service providers. You know, a lot of money goes, goes into procurement. And without the proper procedures and structures to make it very difficult to, be, uh, to work with, co with corruption, then it, it becomes too easy to be corrupt. And so many of these mechanisms really have the purpose of making it more difficult to be corrupt in a very simple way of saying it and presenting it. And um, so these mechanisms, for example, in e-procurement, when a tender goes out, if it goes out to different companies from the government with very clear information and it goes out um, via, in a digital method such as email, the responses that are sent, the bids that are submitted can be presented through email, which makes it difficult for other people to have access to what is the content of the bid, for example, and to you know, start to play around with those numbers in order to be accepted in this process. So information technology makes it much more difficult for there to be corruption, so it's very important. Um, there are other issues such as uh, an organization should regularly conduct risk assessments related to corruption. Um, they should review their procedures. Um, I think also they should make sure that the incentives that they provide within the organization as far as their employees are concerned are incentives that reward and respect people who work with employees that work with integrity. Because then if the norm becomes working with integrity and the people who work with integrity are the ones who are cited for promotions or for recognition, then there's also a real incentive that is tangible within the organization for people to work with integrity. And the message is very strong from the human resources department and from the management of the organization that if you work with integrity, you are valued within the organization. 
Ellen, thank you very much for a very interesting conversation. My pleasure, thank you. Uh, and I, I wish a success to activity and work of your organization. Uh, dear friends, uh, director, of, uh, uh, director of Integrity Education Network of Tiri International Organization was our guest today. Goodbye and keep watching our uh, program, uh, Power of Law.